Good morning. Thank you for joining us for changing your audit reports when using a data-driven approach. Our speakers this morning are Joe Warringell and Kim Jones with Visual Risk IQ. They are integration partners with Automation Services. Before we get started, there are a couple housekeeping notes. This webcast will earn you one NASBA CPE credit. You must respond to all three polling questions and stay logged in for the entire webcast. If you have any questions, you may enter them in the question box on the right side of your screen. We will answer questions at the end of the webcast. This webcast is being recorded. The slides, recording, and CPE certificates will be emailed out next week. Joe and Kim, thank you for presenting with us. Let's go ahead and get started. Thank you, Lindsay. Appreciate everybody joining us here. And uh, again, what we're gonna focus on today are the changes that you might expect to have in your audit reports when you're using a data-driven approach, right? The historical internal audit in the example focused. Now we're not saying we looked at 10 or 25 items and we have a single exception or three exceptions and extrapolating that exception to the population. Uh, here we're saying that we've looked at the entire population of expenditures um, in these examples, and here's what we think of uh, here's what we think of those exceptions that we encountered throughout the entire population. Um, to, again, today is the fourth webinar in the series, and please join us next Friday when we invite our client Stacy Tronto from East Carolina University to talk about how she's incorporated these changes into their analytics program and advice for you looking to incorporate some of the same methodology changes into uh, into your program. The, um, the body of knowledge, which we've talked about consistently throughout the, uh, the webinar series, today we're focused primarily on visual reporting and also some change management and strategic thinking considerations. Uh, taking more of a data-driven approach in reporting. Um, so here's what we're going to cover. And from our quick start methodology, we're going to focus primarily on the fourth, third and fourth steps. Before we jump into that, though, let's talk a little bit about internal auditing standards and the use of data analytics. There's three internal auditing standards that we're going to focus on today. The first involves planning, which we covered in webinar number two, and this reminds us that we must consider the use of technology-based audit and also data analysis techniques when doing our audit planning. We have responsibilities that our internal audit communications must include engagement, objectives, scope, and results. And finally, for a particular opportunity to use analytics, we're going to talk about how to incorporate data analytics in monitoring and making sure that management action plans have been addressed. So let's think about what we've learned so far. Good news, if you're on this webinar today, you're planning to, to use data analytics or you're using it already, so we certainly satisfy that first standard. Again, how are we changing our audit reports to reflect the use of analytics addresses the second point in the standard. And the third standard regarding um, follow-up process, Kim and I have some ideas on how to make uh, more of a data-driven follow-up process. So focusing on writing queries and analyzing and reporting. And a recap of the learning objectives for today's webinar, um, talk a little bit about exploratory and confirmatory analytics. We will also uh, talk about how to incorporate analytics into our follow-up testing. And then we've got some examples for you where we've used IDEA and also visual reporting tools like Tableau and Power BI together to satisfy audit reporting objectives. So, um, lighten things up a bit. We start talking about internal audits. Are we making our conclusions based on evaluation of a sample or evaluating a population or perhaps making a from time to time? 
the uh, the internal audit deep dive. And uh, not sure what a deep dive is, um, but I certainly hear it in practice, and this is always what I have in my mind's eye when I hear it. So, uh, so not a fan. Let's uh, let's use a, a test of a population. So, in providing examples of how audit reports can change with the data-driven approach. We thought we'd ask a few questions and understand what your internal audit reports look like. That is, are your reports primarily or only observations and recommendations? Perhaps are you rating issues at the issue level or are you rating the entire report? How much emphasis do you put in your audit report on the background and context? Why was that audit report selected? Um, most of your reports look like the others. Are there any groups experimenting with what we would call an agile or a more focused audit with a shorter reporting cycle? And with that, we'll uh, come to our first polling question. Thank you. Our first polling question for the day, as Joe said, is what do your internal audit reports include most often today? A, findings and recommendations only. B, findings and recommendations and background that usually includes tables and charts to clarify scope. C, findings, recommendations, background, and an overall rating for the report. D, findings, recommendations, background, and a rating for each issue. Or E, we have many different report formats depending on the audit. Most reports fit into more than one choice. Just as a reminder, you must fill out all three of our polls today in order to receive your CPE credit. So this is our first poll, and I will give you a few seconds to respond, and then I will show you the results. All right. I'll give you a few more seconds and let's see the results. So, majority of you, 32%, have audit reports that look like C. Um, overall ratings for the reports with findings, recommendations, and background, followed by a close tie for B and E, where you have just findings, recommendations, and backgrounds with some charts and tables or a variety of formats. Let's turn it back to Joe. Interesting. Well, thank you. The, um, the uh, next thing we wanted to talk about is what we'll characterize as an audit evidence hierarchy, that is, what types of audit evidence are most convincing or most persuasive as it relates to supporting a particular conclusion? And just as the, uh, the stair steps show here, starting with inquiry on the left, moving up to observation, which is a greater form of assurance, up to examining documentary evidence, documentation, up again to analytic procedures and even to reperformance. We would tell you and uh, the PCAOB, external audit, authorities would tell as well that as you move up in um, an audit evidence hierarchy, your audit evidence becomes more and more reliable. And data analytics, including IDEA, is particularly helpful because analytic procedures that you would use caseware idea for or as an example uh, reperforming and evaluating an entire report let's just say for a moment that management has provided an aging report how many um, receivables are under 30 days 31 to 60 days 61 to 90 etc um, if the invoice file is provided and instead of relying on the 
report that's prepared by internal management, we use IDEA to build our own report. That's an example of analytic procedures or even reperformance. And if our report matches what management provides, then we have the greatest degree of confidence that that audit report is uh, effective and can be relied on. So we want to talk a, a good bit here about what kinds of data analytic tests we want to use um, and also what type of a test they are. The, uh, the first type of audit tests that I think we are more familiar with in the internal audit world are clearly confirmatory tests. And Kim and I believe there are opportunities to use the capabilities of IDEA, its visualization uh, capabilities for exploratory analytics as well. So let us explain confirmatory analytics and also exploratory together. Um, that terms, these come just from John Tu, who's often considered the father of modern statistics. These terms predate World War II that are still used today in internal audit guidance um, and practice that uh, have been recently published by the IIA. Confirmatory tests are the kinds of closed-ended questions that we most often use IDEA for. Is there someone who has access to our information service? who is not an active employee in our HR file. That's a left join where we're joining data from a computer access list to a HR file. Uh, very closed-ended question. It's answered yes or no. There is someone or there's not someone who um, is in one file but not, a, not the other file. Exploratory analysts are more of the open-ended questions that you might use to understand the data before determining what confirmatory questions to ask. Exploratory questions are particularly helpful in documenting the audit scope. In the introductory part of an internal auditor's audit report, describe some statistics for the business process or the department that was reviewed and provide background information on why that audit was selected. These are opportunities to provide more open-ended questions to rank largest to smallest, oldest to newest, um, most number of employees to fewest number of employees part to whole, what percentage of employees are in this population or that population. Um, distribution no. charts are all examples of um, exploratory and confirmatory analytics. Kim? So I think that, that uh, while we tended to use IDEA, as you described, much more in the confirmatory range of, of queries that, that and, Interestingly, as I look back on, on the typical use of IDEA uh, in the past for internal audit, when we were looking more at sampling than in uh, exploring whole populations, exploratory queries uh, that are very powerful in IDEA uh, played an important role in that, and understanding the data and the patterns so that we could uh, create our sampling algorithms effectively uh, gathering evidence, the profiling in, in IDEA is extremely powerful. And, and so it tool too can be a very powerful tool when we're exploring whole populations to, to gather some basic facts about the data before we, we head into uh, uh, creating our questions and, uh, and uh, getting into the actual audit itself. Good, good point, Kim. I think about the idea of summary commands, right? And we, um, whenever we have a new data set and we look at control totals, we'll get the, um, the grand total footed for the file and it tell us the five largest, the five smallest, or 
the five most negative um, transactions. It'll typically calculate a median for us and maybe some variance and standard deviation um, statistics as well. So that's an example of an exploratory analytic beyond just the, the single click that, uh, that we suggest with, uh, with some of the other capabilities of IDEA, including the new powerful graphic features that are available beginning in version 9. And we've got a couple of examples for you here at the moment. Before we do that, though, let's, um, let's ask our second polling question, which is understanding how much time folks spend on exploratory queries as a percentage of their total data analytics effort for a, a particular project. Curious how much time uh, folks spend. Yes. Our second polling question is, how much time do you spend on exploratory queries as a percentage of all analytics efforts? Yes, this time is spent exclusively of data acquisition and data prep. So assuming that the data has been prepared and now you're writing your, your queries, how much of the query writing and interpreting time is spent on exploratory queries versus confirmatory? Yes. Our options are A, none, B, less than 25%, C, between 25 and 50%, or D, 50% are more. Um, just as a, again, a short reminder, you need to respond to all of the questions in order to receive CPE credit. And we're going to go ahead and share the results from everybody. 38% um, of you chose, 38% um, chose B and 38% chose C. So majority of, of you spend less than 25%, so around 20-ish percent to about 50% on exploratory queries. 14% um, said 50 or more, and 10% said none. Let's turn it back to Joe and let's share an audit finding that actually came from exploratory earlier in my career. Um, Kim and I mopped up some sample data uh, to reflect a, uh, a problem that I had encountered in a past organization that had done some work for. And in particular, the problem or challenge that this organization was facing was a, uh, a sales pattern that was not consistent from business unit to business unit, region to region within the company. So here is a, uh, some words for particular audit finding. Um, the background is that both of the, the company's larger regions have a fairly similar mix of folks. They require the same kind of material and also labor inputs to meet their sales goal. And in the first region, sales were made fairly evenly through the period, but in the second region, uh, things tended to start off very slow at each of the periods and then had a big period end push to meet their budget targets. And even in a world where most workers were salary, yeah, those to hourly, um, the things that we encountered were, were really not good for business. And how could we explain that instead of writing a, an audit finding that looks a lot like the words here on slide 15? We decided to show for the first time in uh, in one of our audit reports how to uh, how to see this information first in a table, which we have here. And so, table on the left is our fairly regular um, selling approach, and then table on the right was region two, the one that had very heavy period end push, and you see, wow, the last day 
beginning of the month. Um, region two sold more than five times what uh, region one did. Um, why is that for uh, for an organization that um, would expect to have fairly similar sales um, given similar product mix? So this is what the information looked like in table form. And then this is what it looked like uh, we've recreated here an idea. Kim, you want to talk to the, the group about how you, uh, you did these two graphs and both what the, the bar chart and line charts are showing us? Uh, indeed, Joe. The, the, uh, you know, we started with the data that you saw on the previous slide and, uh, and imported it uh, by Excel and the two sheets that were in it uh, into uh, IDEA. And, I was uh, a newbie when I did this uh, a week or two ago in terms of, of uh, the capabilities, the visualization within ideas, many of you may be, um, and was tickled to find how easy it was to turn those that Excel data as it became a uh, table within and a file within idea to turn it into these charts. and. The, the process after importing, which you always do when you're getting data from external sources uh, of various types, is a matter of opening the database and then navigating to the analysis menu. And then on the far right, you'll see, and that, and uh, in 10.3, it's, it's just called visualize, and uh, certainly recommend that you upgrade to the latest version of of idea it's, it's you know has a lot of new and powerful features and uh click on that and you end up uh with a uh the ability to create dashboards and the dashboards you can you can have up to four charts on each dashboard and and i created this what that you're seeing here with with uh two dashboards each of which had two panels on them and but it was it was only a few clicks and very logical clicks away to to uh, pick a uh, chart type uh, and the chart types available are column chart bar chart line chart so I use obviously a, uh, the column chart for the sales on the left and a line chart for what uh, I calculated as the running percentage. Uh, across the month as if we, if we went from the first day sales through the last day sales and obviously both of them end up at 100% of the sales but you can see uh, in the chart uh, on the top that it's a fairly regular and you, with the exception of the weekends it's a fairly straight line from the bottom left to the top right whereas on the bottom chart for region, region 2 uh, it starts very slowly and then accelerates and has that sort of elbow type uh, the last week of the month uh, that takes them from from uh, what about 50 a little more than 50 percent all the way up to 100 percent very uneven very in, in a way to me suspicious can that really happen uh, is that really how their sales go um, but i was fickle as i mentioned with with uh the ease with which I was able to create these two and put them side by side, uh, illustrating the normal, more normal sales progression on the top for region one and the uh, accelerated towards the end of the month approach that region two had. And uh, very powerful. I, I encourage you to, uh, to explore this with uh, either a trial version if you're new to Tableau or a uh, the current 2103 version uh, as vehicles for creating charts like this for your audit report. And again, think how powerful this is in communicating to your uh, people and the people that are looking at the audit uh, with graphs like this uh, as compared to the words or the chart on the previous slide. Good, Kim. Thank you. And, and that's exactly what I wanted to, to talk about next, right? Um, what were the circumstances at uh, this, uh, let's call it imaginary firm, 
how come sales were uh, such different pattern from one region to another. And what you see in the top chart was actually a, even a slowdown in the last week of the month where they were ahead of plan on a pro rata basis that three weeks into the month, they were more than, let me put my, my cursor right on it, more than three weeks into the month, kind of with five days left in the month, they were more than 80% of the way to their sales goal. So the last week of the month, they sort of coasted to the target. And um, that told us some things about our incentive program, apparently exceeding the goal is not worth much more than meeting the goal exactly. So they tended to slow down and then they would start off the next period with a lot of wind at their back um, with that much more greater progress toward their goal. What was the second region down at the bottom is, and, and this can happen in a, a, any kind of a business where you have channel partners. So imagine you're a, a food company who sells to distributors, who sell to grocery stores, who then sell to end consumers. If you're the distributor, you can hit your sales targets just by encouraging the grocery stores to take extra product. And the store will maybe have more on their shelves, but that doesn't mean that consumers are putting more in their grocery carts. Um, in the pharmaceutical business, having more product out of the larger um, distribution companies from the Kessens, the Bergens, the Amerisource, the, uh, the Cardinal, having more drugs at the distributor doesn't mean that doctors are writing more prescriptions. And what was happening in this Region 2 business was that the um, organization, the sales department in particular, was looking at how far along they were toward hitting their sales goals. And as Ms. King mentioned, 50, 55% through um, the Friday before the last week of the month, then they would contact their distributors and encourage them to take more product, perhaps more product than they actually needed so that the sales targets could be met. And again, presenting these very steep lines in the case of the sum of the rolling percentage, as we've got on the two right-hand panels, or just the left panels and seeing the two charts side by side or top to bottom, um, it was very clear that Region 2 was selling forecast. And our finding our recommendation was that we were just one, one bad weather day or one um, issue in the warehouse with goods movement, you know, one one adverse event in the last week of the month, and we would miss our sales target by 10% or more. So we wanted to encourage the organization to behave much more like Region 1 and much less like Region 2 in this particular example. So hope that's clear. We've got a couple of other audit report examples that we're going to show. Um, one of the nice things about public sector work, each of these audit reports are actually out online. So um, the web links will, uh, will be materials if anyone wants to drill into these reports in a bit more detail. Um, what Kim and I did was we went out and looked at procurement or card audits specific in switch out from um, PowerPoint to look at the individual report. And what we see here is a report from the internal auditor at a county in, I think, Tennessee. And this is a report on the credit card program for their school system. And like the internal audit standards say, they have background and also objectives and scope. And then we'll look at some of their findings. So why did they do the audit? What did they find? 
there were 15 issues, bullet, 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 recommendations and management response, and um, plenty of, of good and solid audit work and audit findings here. But primarily is that it's it's mostly words, 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 except for a few tables, and there was some uh, some inappropriate spend. As we show here in um, in the audit report, and we can imagine how analytics were used to identify um, these issues and how the totals were summarized. I think this is an example of a good audit report, but there may have been opportunities to uh, to be even better. And we'll compare that report to a similar public report from my local county uh, here in Mecklenburg County, Charlotte, North Carolina. Let me uh, get out to our browser and we'll look at this report uh, from the chief internal auditor in Mecklenburg County here in North Carolina, Joanne and her team. So similar report, they've done this review. They're here, there is an overall control evaluation. And then they have individual risks that are color coded, red, yellow, green, as it relates to criticality, also design and operation. And then from that summary table where the individual issues have been rated, then they drill into findings and recommendations. And just like in the Knox County audit report, there's also a nice description of why we chose to audit this particular program and what the, uh, the total spending was and while some of the same techniques that we described in the NOC report came and I thought it was a little bit um, better context to see some of the the total um, spend presented in some fairly simple graphs uh, prior to getting us into the detail and then this is the one that we included in the PowerPoint slides. Um, describe the monitoring program, the rebate program, and then the individual findings and recommendations. So, um, kind of going, if you will, from good to, I think, better um, in Mecklenburg County, and then have a, uh, a third example to show. And while this is not a, a full audit report, we're actually going to show what's possible with a, a very interactive um, presentation of the spend data. And um, I'll hop out and show some similar information from the city of Toronto. In the city of Toronto, this is not a full audit report. Rather, they have just built a bunch of quite colorful charts and graphs. Uh, profiling all of the spending and what you see they're interactive so as i click on petrocan which is um, a, one of the larger gas stations in uh, gas station chains in canada when i click on petrocan we see how much of the things that the city of toronto has purchased from petrocan that was diesel or gasoline um, it was purchased by the waste management department or the fire department. I also want to see how much of that weekend spending, what departments had, uh, had spent the $5,500, $5,600 on the weekend. Most of the spending was done from EMS, the ambulances or the fire services, and a much smaller percentage of weekend spent from waste management compared to weekday spend. Um, from waste management, where waste management dominates uh, compared to the fire department or emergency medical. So again, a very interactive presentation of data from the city of Toronto compared to fairly static presentation 
from uh, Knox County in Mecklenburg County in uh, in North Carolina. Kim, anything that you wanted to add about the uh, the differences in reporting techniques here as we see three different um, PCART projects done by different audit teams? No, I think one thing that I that I noted as I as I would, uh, drilled into the capabilities of IDEA was that uh, most of these these chart types, the the, uh, the bar type and the tree tree maps are available within IDEA. So don't feel that that even though this city uh, used one of the other tools to produce this particular dashboard, uh, don't feel constrained by the fact that you may not yet ha have that type of tool, but but rather take advantage of the of the power that you have within an idea to to visualize uh, elements of your your audit report and the data that you're analyzing using idea itself. Indeed, good. And I, again, I think this is a a really helpful report from Joanne, the team at Beck County here in uh, in Charlotte, that she's. Her team has provided some general spending information about the procurement cards prior to getting into the findings and recommendations, understanding the scope of the program as $3 million out of a, a county with a, a budget that approaches a billion dollars, $3 million out of hundreds of millions is different than if this were a, an audit of a larger uh, public sector program. So. Helpful, good stuff. Well, let's um, let's finally talk about uh, the use of data analytics in follow up. And Kim and I have some some thoughts here on using analytics very specific to um, the follow up process. Recall from our discussion earlier, internal audit does have responsibilities specific to checking in on the status of um, of recommendations made by management and uh, making sure that the uh, the status of those findings as previously reported have been acted upon. And particularly in a world where um, audit findings and recommendations have originated from data analytics, we believe there's an excellent opportunity to use data analytics in follow-up. So agile auditing is a principle that says, just like in agile systems development, more of an iterative approach compared to traditional audit project management, um, very focused on a few key risks, tend to be short audits. In fact, um, when public accounting firms describes an agile audit, is something that they routinely do in two weeks or less. Here we're saying two to four weeks might be okay, um, but certainly allowing the internal audit to be more nimble and responsive. So in comparing the top chart, kind of their traditional audit scope, very linear or waterfall, moving from planning to kickoff to gathering information, to testing, to reviewing issues, and then reporting, you go from step one to step two to step three to step four with documents um, being distributed um, in a very sequential way. The future state, the agile uh, internal audit, involves project owners meeting with their team, having a very short and iterative meetings, often daily, before producing a retrospective audit report that summarizes what's been learned in just a couple of weeks. And again, our suggestion would be to explore ways of using agile auditing and analytics together to um, change the way your reporting is done. And that brings us to our final polling question, which is to understand how folks on this webinar may um, use data analytics and monitoring the implementation of prior audit recommendations. 
Yes. This is our third polling question, as Joe said. I uh, you need to have responded to all <coughs> excuse me, all three polling questions to get your CPE credit. Um, our options are um, regarding having used data analytics to, and monitoring the implementation of audit recommendations, never, once or twice, or regularly. Um, I'm going to give you a few seconds to respond, and then we will share the results. All right, I'll go ahead and show what y'all have said. Um, the majority of you said, have said never, actually. 33% um, of you um, use data analytics in this area uh, once or twice, and only about 10% of you do so regularly. And I'm going to go ahead and turn it back to Joe. See what we're envisioning is the, the follow-up. Now imagine a... Uh, an internal audit finding that says we compared the IT system access list to the HR file and we found that terminated users still had access to the company's um, key information systems and that we recommended that management put some new controls in place so that IT would be notified more promptly when HR uh, when HR terminations or job status changes were made, and uh, the management's response was yes, we agree. It's a good good suggestion. We're going to implement new procedures to make sure that um, make sure that. Uh, terminations happen on a more frequent basis, and that change is going to be completed by the end of the next quarter. So instead of the full scope audit that resulted in that finding, what Kim and I are suggesting here is, gosh, we used IDEA. We did a, a join between the HR file and the IT system access file. Wouldn't it be helpful to rerun that query? and see how effective the changes in procedures or the changes in process have been. So just by reacquiring new data for the end of the next quarter, comparing the HR file to the IT system access file, we would be able to report on the success of the new procedure in, a, uh, in an agile way. So wonderful opportunity to move from one-time or ad hoc analytics to more repeatable continuous auditing or continuous monitoring. And again, agile auditing can be a way to help us get from one way to the other. So before we get to, uh, to questions, uh, Kim and I just have a couple of closing thoughts. Um, Kim, anything you want to, to introduce here? No, I think that the last thought that you shared, Joe, in terms of of uh, going back through a second time, I mean, the, the, the sustainability and repeatability of, of an analytic, uh, both in the context of the, the next audit report, but very importantly, a look back at uh, helping to identify uh, how effective the changes that have been affected might have been. Uh, been by taking the previous audit's uh, focus and recalculating some of the uh, some of the analytics in order to sort of show progress. So I think analytics uh, can be used in an extremely effective way in in sort of proving uh, the the in focusing on the sustainability of the analytic itself, but also in helping to illustrate for uh, the audit committee or whomever the stakeholders are uh, that progress is being made or, or not being made. And I think analytics can be used in both situations. Agreed. So the, uh, the takeaways, as we suggest, um, certainly if you're not using tables or charts in your audit reports today, we believe you're, you're missing the key opportunity. 
So what are those charts and tables are going to be used in the background section and explaining why the particular audit was selected before getting into the findings and recommendations. Certainly there's opportunities to use charts and tables in the background section as uh, a couple of our examples had, uh, had shown. And in the, the sales and the channel problem in, uh, in the uh, the examples that we had mocked up with idea, um, certainly the uh, the graphs themselves uh, communicated the the issue that needed to uh, to be acted on. So if you're not using charts and tables, you are missing key opportunity. And let, let's explore some of the chart types to uh, let the data speak. Again, more opportunities to focus on exploratory queries in addition to confirmatory explain why a particular area was the scope for an audit. And again, we're a big fan of rerunning idea scripts as part of an agile or a follow-up audit. Um, opportunities to provide better assurance at a very low cost. It's not just we spoke to HR and we spoke to IT and they told us that there was a new process to make sure that terminations were uh, removed from the IT system access on a more frequent basis, but let's do the test. Let's do the, the join between the two data files and make sure that that better communication is being acted on appropriately. Uh, the other benefit of rerunning the idea scripts can actually be employee um, training. Um, that is, if you have one person who's developed the scripts, go ahead and have a different person run them. And that gives you a really good opportunity to make sure that the documentation that the first auditor prepared um, is able to be followed by the second person that might be involved in that testing. So that helps make sure that your analytics are more sustainable and repeatable. And it may point out um, opportunities to improve documentation as well. We really like um, running uh, scripts as part of follow-up, both for the assurance, but also for the, uh, the employee orientation standpoint. And then finally, and perhaps the most important recommendation coming out of today is to make sure that you begin to experiment with ideas, visual capabilities, or even perhaps dabble in connecting your idea data to other visualization tools. If there's some charts that you want to create that you can't, um, you can't do with idea. Uh, certainly starting with idea is the way to go. And we hope as you've seen in today's webinar, we believe a picture is worth a thousand words or maybe even more. And with that, we'll, uh, we'll transition to questions from the audience and, uh, see how, um, what you may want to know as it relates to questions uh, related to using data analytics in your audit reporting process. Lindsay? Thank you. Um, I will let you go ahead and type in some questions on the question box if you have any. Um, just to, as a quick reminder, we'll be sending out the recording and the CPEs um, next week. And um, let me turn it over to Joe and see if we have any questions. How are you doing, Joe? Very good. Happy to uh, see we've got a couple of questions coming in. Um, there's one that was asked on a, a shared database of online information um, for idea scripts for Agile audits. And I think the, the answer to that is actually what we had shared in, um, in a session session three, or, sorry, session two on brainstorming. That is, what are the questions that idea scripts can be very helpful for? Uh, there's not a special subset of questions that would be directed exclusively for agile audits, but I think that the brainstorming that uh, we had shared in, in session two would be absolutely a, uh, a good input for that. Um, the question was asked on um, idea of providing simple infographic type visuals, and um, I'm afraid I'm stuck on the, the definition of infographic, so I think, Lindsay, I'm going to take that, um, that question offline and uh, perhaps correspond via email 
um, with the person to make sure that we have the right definition in our heads when they say infographic, what's in their head, we can certainly show what's uh, capable with IDEA and also Tableau or Power BI and I'm sure match up what uh, what we're aiming for. Um, right. I, I think that sounds like a great idea. I just I do want to be sure that for everyone else that they do know that idea does have some basic, not quite Tableau level, but um, visualization options for graphs here and there. Um, I also want to make sure it this there are not scripts specifically for agile audit, but there is a idea script vault. Um, through the passport with caseware, um, which you can get to through IDEA. So if you have questions about that, um, we can also share that in the follow-up email that we send. Indeed. Um, there are free scripts Thanks. that IDEA user can use. And with the new mm -hmm. version 10, you can also use the Python script vault. Good. Um, yeah, the infographic. I think I'm I'm just confused in, in terms of what is it? What do we mean when we say infographic? We obviously showed uh, bar charts, line charts, et cetera, um, in the example. When I when I hear infographic, I think uh, more cartoon kind of you know, building a a bar chart with um, stickmen or footballs or dollar signs. That's what I have in uh, in my mind's eye as it relates to infographics. So that's why I want to see what uh, what others have uh, have in mind when they use that term the, uh, yes. <laughs> the last, I agree. the uh, the last question that I see is is how idea and, and tableau can be best used together um, the uh, the questioner is asking says that they've been using idea for a few years now um, but lots of times their data is coming from multiple ERPs um, we just started using Tableau and we've been happy with it. Um, I guess the way that I would, would answer that question is uh, we think of, of data analytics as, as the exploratory queries and also the confirmatory queries. And in, um, in general, uh, IDEA's strengths are its scripting language, the ability to handle data from multiple data sources, and visualization is something that they've been adding beginning with uh, version 9. So we use IDEA together with Tableau, often doing some simple visualizations with IDEA, and then combining the output and the um, results from IDEA as it relates to um, joins and scripting and inserting new columns. But then we all often do uh, use Tableau for visualizations using the two of the tools together. So I hope that addresses the uh, the last question that we that I see, Lindsay. Let me know if I've I've missed one. Um, but That's I think that's the last question uh, I see as well. Oh, well. Do you have um, maybe a a resource where um, people could find more examples of how they could use visualization in their report? I, I, I think what we'd, we'd probably be best to to do is is um, understand who's asking that question and maybe spend a, a no charge uh, half hour or hour with them and, and share a little bit uh, more about where we go for for inspiration. It's probably more than I can can cover in just a, a couple of minutes here before the top of the hour and um, kind of uh, doing a brain dump, if you will, and sharing here's all the places that we go is uh is not nearly going to be as useful as understanding what this particular uh, listener is is aiming for um i will make a point to include three resources in a as a bibliography specific to uh visual reporting in our last uh seminar next week with um with stacy toronto from east carolina lindsay uh really good data analytics books that we've been using for um since we started the firm um, 12 years ago, uh, Edward Tufte is an author that um, has written a lot on visualization. Stephen Few has a book called Show Me the Numbers. And um, 
Donna Wong has a really strong book from the Wall Street Journal, and we'll make sure to provide links to uh, those three books in the uh, next webinar. That's a good good suggestion, and we'll we'll get that for uh, for everyone. So sounds wonderful. That, and I'll make sure to connect you with the people who have asked questions. And if you didn't have a question that you wanted to ask on the webinar, but you still want to talk with Joe or something comes up later, feel free to reach out and we will get you connected. Thanks, everyone. Have a good weekend. Yeah, have a great afternoon. Bye.